You see it all the time. People at concerts, people in museums, people in front of beautiful things, not actually taking it in with their own eyes, but looking at it through the projection of their iPhone. And uh, it's, it's very sad to me. It's sad to me, the idea that they're not really appreciating what is before them. I find this just the most devastating thing about modern times, that people don't even know what they're missing. I uh, had always worked in color, but I always defined myself as a black and white photographer for my own personal work. And it was only when my mother came for her last trip to Europe and we decided to go to Paris where she had lived. There happened to be an exhibition of Odilon Redon. And he is an artist that we both admired a lot. We walked through the exhibition, and it was one room after the other of his noirs, his lithographs. We asked ourselves, well, where are the paintings? Which we knew better. They were all in the last few rooms. The reason being that this man had not really begun to work with paint until he was nearly 60. I really felt like maybe I should give it a try. I mean, look at this man. He, he, he made the most beautiful works in color after all this lifetime of, of dedicating himself to black. And that's really how it happened. It was a true revelation. I have always looked at each photograph almost as if it were a short story. And I like people to look at them. Each singular image has a story in it. The title, The Color of Chance. I chose the title because of these two important terms, color, which is a new part of my work, and the idea of chance. Chance is one of the most fundamental and fascinating aspects of photography. I think it's something that people denigrate most of the time. Oh, he just had luck with that shot. It should be celebrated. Uh, fortune rewards the brave, as the saying goes. As Larry Fink said, if you don't take a chance, you don't get a chance. Photographing in color has radically changed the way I observe the world around me. I'm, I'm still attracted to the same sort of subject matter, the elusive, the absurd, the, the real as opposed to artifice, barriers, delicate, precarious things. But with the possibilities of color now, the eye-brain reflex is moving in a way that it never did before. If before with black and white, it was the line and the form, and above all, the light striking them. Now, often it's the element of color. It's kind of like the colors are sending out a defining scent to draw me into their atmosphere. It can be a really subtle fragrance, or it can be shockingly strong. So in a way, if the object was the jumping off point for my black and white work, the subject now is often color itself. But still, color can't be enough. As Kandinsky wrote, colors are the keys of the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, and the soul is the piano with many chords. I really believe that images have to be inspired from within. I 
I can so rarely make an image if there's someone with me. It requires total and absolute uh, concentration and, and solitude. When I go out to photograph, I really go out to photograph. I don't go to the supermarket and bring my camera along, and if I happen to see something on the way, I'll take the photograph. It's not the way I can work. I have to be totally and utterly concentrated. So when I do see something that I want to photograph, it's really immediate and it's definite. It's always been really hard for me to describe what it is or why it is that I stop before something. I think this has to do with your psyche. I'm always very, very sensitive to the way the sun is illuminating that form and the geometry that it's expressing. The most important thing when you're choosing to make a photograph is to look at where the sun is and to understand how much time you have because very often in my work, it's a certain ray of light or a certain kind of light that may not be there very long. The most fundamental question in my eye is where you decide to plant your feet. In my case, the tripod. So the next step for me is to decide how much of what I'm standing in front I want to include and exclude, and that reflects on the lens that I pull out of my bag. Once I put the lens on, it's a question of tweaking the borders, the edges, by moving a little bit closer or a little bit further. Basically, framing and understanding this crazy upside down backward image because it is totally incomprehensible and all you are dealing with is shape, is composition. And so many times I have seen things on the ground glass which I cannot understand and say, look at that shape, what is that there? And have to look and understand what it is that I'm seeing that is causing that to enter the, the, the ground glass. At that point, I insert my precious uh, sheet film. And then there are those situations where you set up your shot And then you wait, and you wait. Maybe there's wind, maybe there are people in the image, and you simply are there with the cable shutter release in your hand, and you're looking and you're saying no, 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 and then finally yes. 
And that definitive moment is so, so exhilarating. It's, it's just the definitiveness about your decision and the moment that you've chosen to, to freeze there. You do work with geometrical forms and another really important point in my life was when I took a photograph in Paris of a facade of a nondescript condominium building and it had basically every geometrical form known to man including the spiral and that image took me off on another direction and I began studying geometry more than I had in school and geomancy I think it's beautiful to think about geometry and how the sun, uh, which is what orients everything, plays on the surfaces of buildings and how it delineates them and how, how we have to be sensitive to that if we're photographing urban situations. Very often, the interest in the picture is right on the edge of the image. Uh, I, I, I love that. It's part of the meticulous work that you do on, on studying the composition. The significance of each of the geometric forms, each one, the square, the triangle, the rhombus, they all have deep meaning. I had to photograph an Etruscan statue in the Chianti, and I took several pictures of this head. I had lots of time with different lenses, and I show this to students. The change in the form of this head, moving simply 50 centimeters, it's like a foot and a half, one way or another, radically changed. The rapport of the nose to the hair to the forehead, it's a really extraordinary lesson. I think that the heart of this show is in the rag series, where each color has a chance to express itself and set its own mood. My initial response was just how amazing the situation was where each color was segregated from all the other colors. And each room of this warehouse had its own color. Uh, that was just so remarkable in view of the fact that I just decided to begin photographing in color. One of those incredibly fortuitous, lucky again, uh, moments in life. I really felt like each room had its own tone. Each room had its own atmosphere. I prefer to let people look at images and take out of each image whatever their eye and whatever their brain wants to, but I will say that when I walked into this warehouse and saw the first piles of these rags lying there, um, my immediate thought was the photographs of Auschwitz after the liberation. And uh, the fact that these rags were frequently clothes that had been worn by people also added uh, a really powerful connotation. That's really what struck me most about this weird place. Yeah, no, that, that's true. It's true in general in my work, but I really want to emphasize 
that there is not one image here in this show that doesn't talk about people and doesn't talk about what man has done to nature or to his surroundings. A photograph where that is not present would not be interesting to me. I mean, I really am no longer very interested in photographing the woods, and I'm really much more interested in the relationship between man and nature. But uh, man is here in every image. Rather than photographing nature itself, I really much prefer to examine man's interaction with nature. I'm fascinated by how the plant world can survive in urban settings. Precariousness has always been a really important character of my work, and the balance between man and his environment is a very compelling theme. I love to look and see and capture the effect of time and nature extending their hands and their influence on, for example, this old wall. That's really what the image behind me is all about, this, the image of uh, this cement wall. Uh, it, it is a wall that's been built by, by someone and a plant was permitted or happened to grow there, and it left its imprint on what man had built. The color in this picture, it's very subtle, but I think the image is so much more beautiful in color because of those delicate orange, uh, pink windows that have been painted into the scene. It makes absolutely no sense. Another one of my fascinations with real and the artifice I mean, what the hell are those fake windows doing there? But they are sort of the punctum of the image. Uh, I, I, I just fell in love with those very beautiful, delicate colors. I do have lots of photographs in this last section, which have to do with walls. Walls are magnificent because of what has happened to them over time. It's just a blank wall. And what's happened to it is that over God knows how many decades, the dust, the pollution from the city has deposited these dark shapes on this white wall. And what you get is this almost Japanese-like landscape painting. But it is another form of a barrier. And it's so ironic that uh, the world is getting smaller and smaller and we should be communicating better with one another. And instead, uh, there's this populist tendency to, to want to keep people out. And it's, it's really very upsetting, especially for someone who spent his whole life moving from one place to another and needing to feel accepted in, in the new town. I really feel for these people, and they are arriving with absolutely nothing but the clothes on their back. Generally speaking, the more artificial colors tend to stand out more uh, so that they can change the mood of the photograph. The mood is basically set by that color. So if it is a man-made, very artificial color, it will come out in the, in the tone and in the mood of the photograph, changing it completely. My previous reservations regarding color photography had to do mostly with how unpredictable and unstable the outcome was. Up until the advent of digital printing, the chemistry was undependable. I believed that black and white imagery was by its nature more metaphorical. But I've discovered that the same elusive nature can be applied to color as well. Um, maybe it's a little more difficult to do with color. Another element 
that I find really fascinating, the passage of time and the way nature can take time to take over, to take back what uh, was there previously. Um, this image behind me, uh, which is my uh, homage to Odilon Redon, um, basically because the shape reminds me of some of his most wonderful uh, etchings. That is an underpass, uh, which is made obviously of a strip of copper. And time and rain has eventually seeped down and changed the colors into what you see there. It's an all naturally made image. Oh man, uh, it's what's keeping me going. Uh, I really, I really feel like if I uh, were no longer interested in making a photograph, I, I would, uh, I would really be lost. Um, the other day, I was in Umbria, and I was setting up a picture, and a woman appeared in a window in the distant building. And I thought it was a nice little detail that I wanted to keep. And it was that excitement. Am I going to be able to set up in time to have her there in, in the window? Okay, with, with quicker photography, you do it and it's done. But with, with me in that moment, it was so exciting to wonder, am I going to make it or not? It's part of the adventure of photographing. And I was able to, to, to do it in time before she left the window, so I'll probably call that picture woman in a window, rather than underpass. I've been lucky in that uh, the 16 years I was working at uh, the Alinari Archive, I was able to do a lot of my own work. So I was able to balance um, the need to bring in money to support my beautiful family uh, and the need for, for making my own photographs. In fact, this was one of the questions that the uh, director posed to me when he was planning on hiring me. Uh, he said, so, George, everything you make will then belong to the Alinari archive. And I said, nope. Everything that I do on Alinari time, on Saturdays and Sundays and when I'm on vacation, they belong to me. So I was able to get that by, and, uh, and I did lots of my own work. And ever since I left back in 2003, I've been a free man again. I um, consider myself a person of spirit. I'm not uh, a materialist. I really do hope and believe that there is something there that it's not just going to end. I will tell you a story I, uh, of a, I was working on a book. It was a book about female saints in Umbria, where I was living at the time. And I was in a forest above the city of Foligno where one of these uh, saints lived as a hermit, Santa Angela di Foligno. She lived in the woods as a hermit, and I was walking through these woods alone, thinking about this, and a medieval crucifix appeared on this tree that was four meters away from me. Now, someone who is a cynic or a skeptic would never have seen that. It's only because my mind is open that I was able to see that and to make that photograph before the light disappeared. It's really uh, an important image.
long as I can walk around and carry this big, heavy camera along. When that's no longer possible, I'll adapt to smaller uh, mechanisms. It's just a, a need to examine how I am changing myself over time. It's always been a mirror into myself.